Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who've just joined us, my name is Rupini, and I head PR and marketing for Vivriti Asset Management. A very warm welcome to everybody present here today. I will straight jump into the agenda for the day. We will begin by a short piece or a talk around the performing credit space, which will be given by our founder and CEO, Vineet Sukumar of Vivriti Asset Management followed by the news for the day, which is going to be the announcement on our new fund launches, which will be done by Shomendra Ghosh, who's our Chief Investment Officer. And then we will finally open up the floor for question and we'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Vibriti Asset Management's first media conference. Most delighted to have all of you here. Uh, as you guys have gone through the, the video we recently put up, which should serve as a good starting point for our, for our conference. Uh, let's put up the first slide, please. So Vivriti as a, as a group started four years ago with the promise of enabling access to enterprises for debt. Um, and, today, and today, as we have gone through our journey of the last four years, we've developed significantly. Uh, our asset management company today uh, has, has achieved a fairly significant amount of scale and growth, we should be we should be pretty much the fastest growing asset manager in the in the alternate debt space today, uh, having having reached uh, in excess of fifteen hundred crores over the last uh, since we started, which is which is the last fifteen months or so. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we operate in a space which is called performing credit, uh, and to give you guys a sense of what that means, uh, performing credit is essentially. Operating companies raising money for their growth, for scalability, for for, build, for building their businesses, and should be distinguished from the entire non-performing or the distressed space, which is not an area that we focus on at all. Right now, this space is a five hundred billion dollar market. The, the the aggregate debt market in India is a two trillion market. Three quarters of that is taken away by the government of India. A quarter is the corporate bond market, which is five hundred billion. But even today, you will be surprised to know that that the top 10 issuers account for 40% of that market, right? And the and uh, other than the triple A's and the double A's, single A's and triple B rated companies barely get access. They account for less than a quarter of the market today, and that's just moved up in small bits and pieces in the last decade, right? Now, this is a space where we operate. This is a space where we think we can find significant value and we think we can find significant value because the pricing differential that exists today between a triple A, a single A, and a triple B is anywhere from 5% to 8%. But the increase in risk is not that much. For example, a crystal data on the probability of default of single A companies would indicate a probability of 0.5%. Does that sound much? Does that sound very high? Not at all. But you still get 5% extra returns for it. For making the effort, of understanding companies in the A category space and industry. And on the other side, you have a 13 trillion investable surplus earning negative real returns, right? We all know what that means today. Even if, even if we invest into a fixed deposit today in India, it's negative real returns. If you're investing into, if you're a fund manager investing into global US treasuries, it's negative real return, right? Inflation has shot up across the world and we all know what that means to us. It's eroding our wealth as we speak, right? And that's where we come in to create the right risk, risk adjusted return opportunities, which offer post, healthy, positive real returns without significantly adding to the risk of your portfolio. Next slide, please. Right. So, so Vibriti Asset Management in the Indian context operates in, in, the, in performing credit. On the left side, we have the 20 lakh crore uh, debt mutual funds that are predominantly focusing on government debt, AAA and AA plus. On the right side, you have funds that are out there are working with startups, working with real estate, and working with distressed, right? So we don't do double A and double A plus and triple A, and we don't do real estate startups and distressed. We are in between. We will focus on well-run, healthy operating companies. We assess their corporate governance. We assess their ability to build their businesses. We assess the, the quality of their businesses. And then so we do the hard work of bringing these companies into our funds and then creating medium term to long term funds where investors can put their money next slide please right so what sets our funds apart from from uh, from the from the larger community of investable products right 
we have tried over the last 15 to 18 months to combine the best of what a mutual fund has to offer and what a fixed deposit has to offer what a fixed deposit has to offer is is complete certainty you know what your money will be worth tomorrow right you know how your money is going to appreciate day by day right you don't know that in a mutual fund because in a mutual fund you can be marked to market which can be quite vicious for you but what a mutual fund offers is today significant transparency significant disclosures significant governance standards that that define the quality of what they have to offer to build trust right so we try to combine the two we provide stability of returns we provide certainty of returns with the transparency that people have gotten used to to seeing from a fixed income fund manager in the mutual fund space right next slide please now with this i would like to hand over the floor to my to my to my colleague shomendra ghosh who is the chief investment officer of vipti asset management he will walk you through the product launches that we have planned now shomendra over to you thank you very much vineet uh, good afternoon everyone and thank you very much for joining us today we really hope that you and your families are safe wherever you are i am extremely excited to announce the launch of our alpha debt funds which strive to make debt investing simple safe and at the very same time rewarding for private investors next slide please a good starting point for uh, the launch would be to look at what are we solving for and uh, uh, to do this let's look at this through the lens of an investor so firstly there's the issue of yield right uh i don't need to tell you that we are amidst record low interest rates where traditional fixed income is really earning very very little debt mutual funds today are yielding about 5 to 5 and 1/2% post expense and pre tax credit risk funds on the other hand by virtue of their open end net nature means that investors can pull money out at any point of time pose very high liquidity risk to investors which has also led most of the credit risk fund managers of mutual funds to gravitate to highly safe and highly rated debt debt which brings us back to the issue of low returns on top of that high taxation of interest income from direct investments in bonds and deposits leave really very little post tax income in the hands of high net worth individuals family offices that are often times taxed at the highest tax bracket and as a result of all of this none of these traditional modes of investment today manage to beat inflation second comes the issue of market risk duration strategy which uh, refers to essentially buying a highly rated bond and then watching it appreciate in value not because the company got any better but just because market interest rates have kept coming down duration strategy is a thing of the past right and there is consensus and clear logic on why interest rates should be rising over the next 12 to 36 months now this would cause returns from your traditional fixed income investments to worsen because they would have to be marked to market referring to what we need mentioned now coming to options that are available to investors today there are high yield debt options which include early stage investing in the form of venture debt there is distressed investing there is real estate and so on but to achieve these high yields fund managers have to resort to structured debt which often times uh, means lending at the promoter company level having returns linked to events like equity raise which in turn leads to concentration in portfolios uncertainty in cash flows and also long tenure exposure in this space fund disclosures can't be very frequent because the underlying investees are early stage they are they don't have a lot of public information about them and what all of this leads to is high volatility of outcome right at the given rate of yield which does not suit several investors there's a risk appetite of several investors so to summarize the problem statement what investors have been looking for is the ability to increase return but with minimal increase in volatility or risk next slide please now coming to how are the alpha debt funds aiming to solve for this let's start with risk right and we look at risk through three dimensions liquidity risk credit risk and market risk liquidity risk 
Alpha debt funds are closed ended funds, category two AIFs with no liquidity risk. Why do I say this? Firstly, there is no risk of an investor withdrawing money, causing the fund manager to sell assets at a distressed value to meet the redemption. Second, no investments from the fund outlast the tenor of the fund. In, if it did, we would need to sell the investments to redeem capital to investors, which we don't need. Nothing outlasts the tenor of the fund. So that's on liquidity risk, no liquidity risk. On credit risk, the fund invests in debentures issued by steady state operating companies in the performing credit space that we spoke about. What does this do? This firstly ensures that there is low volatility of returns as the investments are fixed income in nature and leaving nothing to events. Secondly, it's easy for investors to assess risk because the investments are rated. Thirdly, as a result of this, the fund's median rating is between A and triple B and uh, reiterating what uh, my colleague said earlier, today, looking over the past decade of performance, the probability of default of an A-rated bond is as less as 0.5%. Right? And lastly, our funds are very well diversified with no exposure crossing 10% of the fund. This sharply reduces the risk to the investor. Next, we come to market risk. Now, the fund invests in bonds with an intent of holding the bond to maturity, and hence we are insulated from any kind of mark to market, because, which may happen because of interest rate movements. Hence, we are neither gaining nor losing from interest rate movements. And uh, reiterating that there is fairly clear consensus on which way the interest rates are headed, no market risk is a good thing. Right? So that's on risk. Now, coming to return. Now, the funds are designed to bring together the best of two worlds. First is that by virtue of being in performing credits, these are bonds which have healthy accrual income, unlike AAA bonds in the public debt space. Right? So that's the first thing. Second, there is possibility of capital gains, which bring about efficiency in taxation, uh, which will be approximately 16 to 17% of taxation in the hands of the investor. Now, as a combination of these two things, what this means for an investor is post-tax returns of seven and a half to nine and a half percent post-tax post expenses in these funds, which is very attractive for the level of volatility in the fund. In each fund, we make sure that the fund manager invests at least two and a half percent of the fund corpus, being explicit about our skin in the game. Uh, and as Vineet mentioned, each fund would be reporting very frequently and very granularly to investors on an ongoing basis. Now, because of all of this, uh, in our preliminary market scoping and feedback, we have seen very significant interest from family offices, high net worth individuals in high tax brackets who've been looking for high yields, but without taking much incremental risk, especially risk of early stage investing, distressed investing or real estate investing. Now I'm going to spend a minute on each of the funds going a little deeper into the two strategies that we are launching under our alpha deck series. Next slide, please. The first one, Alpha Debt Fund is a three and a half year closed ended fund with a corpus of 400 crores. The fund invests in mature stage companies with proven track record of profitability, of scaling up, uh, the promoter and the management navigating business through crisis and being able to access capital, debt and equity over time. As a result, the median rating of this fund will be in the A category. Uh, the fund will be providing debt for very standard purposes of growth and working capital and nothing very fancy. The fund would be well diversified. We expect that no issuer will be more than 10% of the fund. We also have a sectoral cap that no specific sector will be more than 40% of the fund. In spite of doing all of this, the fund aims to beat the, the net yield, net of expenses yield of credit risk funds of mutual funds by 350 basis points. And as a result, return 7.5% post-tax to investors. Next slide, please. 
Coming to our second strategy, which is the Alpha Debt Enhanced Fund. This is also a three and a half year closed ended fund with a corpus of 250 crore. This fund would be investing in high growth companies with proven business models and credible promoters, right? But they are in high growth stages. As a result, the median And rating of the fund would be, would be growth and working capital. The fund would continue to be diversified so that no issuer is more than 10% of the fund. So the ethos of managing the fund stays the same. Now, because we are investing in high growth companies, this fund has an added feature of loss protection. The fund will issue two classes of units to investor with differential levels of risk and return, while on the asset side, both sets of investors stand to gain from the same set of companies. First is the senior units to investors, which is a little over 90% of the fund, which will enjoy priority in cash flow and full protection against one full default of an investment. Second is the subordinated units where investors carry a little higher risk and get lower priority in cash flows, but are rewarded with a risk premium. Now, for the highest level of governance, uh, the fund manager with the asset management will be putting its own corpus into the subordinated tranche, which provides loss protection to the senior units. This fund aims to return 9.4% 9, 9 on a post-tax and post-expenses basis to, to senior investors, which would A, beat the median net of expenses and ne the net of expenses uh, number of credit risk funds by over 550 basis points. And B, importantly, be at par with the high yield funds when it comes to yield, but provide that yield at much, much lower volatility. Right. Next slide, please. What we have laid out is a quantitative and objective benchmarking of these two funds against what are their most logical pairs in terms of both return and volatility. I'm going to summarize this uh, for the two funds on how we see this and why we have gained the kind of interest that we have. Firstly, the alpha debt funds, the incremental return that one gets over mutual funds is much higher than the incremental risk one takes. Coming to the alpha debt enhanced fund, the post-tax return is akin to investing in a high yield fund, but with much lesser volatility, uncertainty, and with loss protection. With that, uh, thrilled to have all of you here and very happy to be launching uh, our alpha debt funds. I will hand it back to my colleague Vineet uh, to take this forward, please. Thank you. Thanks, Shomendra. Uh, we can come back to the slide deck. Uh, I think it's important uh, from the context of uh, how we run this business to also to, to, to keep a close watch on what we will do and what we will not do. Next slide, please. Now, from a, from a, from a risk protection perspective, right, and this is the most, and the most important thing for a fund manager to focus on, right? I had begun this presentation by promising you something that our funds will give a, a far more, a far higher return than the delta risk that uh, that our investors are taking, right? In alpha debt, investors take on a probability of default of 0 0.5, they get reported three and a half percent of a premium over the most, over the closest comparable product in the market. In the alpha debt enhanced, the portfolio takes a risk of approximately a 3% default rate, takes away that risk by giving a seven and a half percent first loss, and still gives a five and a half percent higher return, right? So from a structure perspective, we live up to what we had promised you. Now from a risk management perspective, how do we do it? Risk management is, is in two parts, what we will do and what we will not do, right? What we will do is very deep diligence, right? Our team today spends two days in person with every single investing company. So this is important because this is the kind of infrastructure that you need to set up to run a credit business. We spend two full days in their premises. We visit their inventory locations. We visit their stocking locations. We visit their customer-facing locations. We visit their manufacturing locations. We meet their suppliers. 
we meet their board members, we meet their private equity investors and the entire management. Right? This is what we will do. And we promise to do this for every single investment we make in these two funds. What do we not do? We don't take concentrated bets. Right? We, we tightly limit our exposure per company. We tightly limit our exposure per sector. Right? We ensure that we don't go overboard in our search for yields. We stay within very clear caps in terms of how much can we take at a rating category, how much can we take in a sector, and how much can we take at a company. Extremely important discipline for a fund manager. Right? So as a result today, we strive to protect you from downside risks. Downside risks not only in terms of a credit going bad, but also in terms of an adverse interest rate movement. Right? As Shomendra mentioned, our funds are accrual-based funds, which means that we have a very steady rise in the NAV of what you as an investor might be holding. Right? Having said that, movement and interest rate will not affect us. Right? We might lose out. If market rate, if markets start moving up significantly, right? But we certainly will not, but we certainly will not allow any volatility to creep in into your holdings in the alpha debt and the alpha debt and hedge funds. Next slide, please. Right. Finally, um, we have set this company up with a lot of care, right? Uh, we have we have ensured that we have ensured that uh, that you as an investor should have absolutely no doubt in terms of who you whom you are placing your money with. Right? We are here to be custodians of your money. Right? We have ensured that from a governance perspective, from an audit perspective, from a legal advice perspective, from a tax advice perspective, in terms of financial advisory, as well as in terms of people who are on our board and governance structure and advisory board, we have, we have the right people who, will, who are advising us as we grow this company. Right? We, are, we are ambitious. We think that the performing credit space can become very large. It can become 50,000 crore space for us alone in the next five years, right? And we will do what it takes to ensure that we, we, we hold your confidence while we reach those kind of heights. Right? With that, uh, I come to the end of my presentation. I will just hand the floor to Rupini back. Uh, very nice to see all of you and hope to stay in touch. Rupini. Thank you very much, Vineet. Um, once again, I'd just like to sum it up saying that uh, uh, our intention as Vivriti Asset Management is to be able to provide the right impetus to our investors to invest in our funds, whether it is in the form of mitigating risks or high yields or creating an impact or absolute brilliant governance. We'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. You will see a small Q&A tab at the bottom corner of your screen. I'm going to request that you put in your questions there. It will be very nice to know who is asking the questions or if you could tell us your name and the publication you represent. Um, again, it's optional, but we'd love to uh, know who is attended and who is asking those questions. And uh, we'd be happy to answer any of those questions for us. You could ask us anything around the performing credit space itself, the market scenario, or anything about the funds that we are launching today. Team, can we have uh, uh, Vineet and Shom on the screen uh, while they answer the questions for us, please? So we have the first question. Uh, Shom, I'm going to direct this one to you. What yes, is the tax rate assumed for post-tax yields? And what are the pre-tax yields of the two funds? This question comes from Neil Borate. He also asks, just to confirm that in the second fund, it is 9.4% for the junior class of unit holders and 7.5% for the senior class. Can you, can you just clarify those numbers again for me, please? The question is from Neil Borati. Thank you. Thanks, Rupini. And uh, hi, Neil. Nice to see you here. Uh, I'll clarify. For the Alpha Debt Fund, right, which is the first strategy investing in more mature companies, the headline portfolio level yield we are after is 11.25%, which after uh, fees, expenses, and taxes should be resulting at 7.5% post-tax, post-expense yield in the hands of the investor. Right? There's only one share class of units here. And as a result, there's only 7.5. 
In the second strategy, which is our alpha debt enhanced fund, the headline yield we are after is 14%, which issues two kinds of, the fund issues two kinds of share classes, a senior unit and a subordinated unit. The senior unit is a little over 90% of the fund. The balance is subordinated units. The senior units will receive 9.4% on annualized basis, post expenses and post tax. The subordinated units are expected to receive 13.5% on an annualized basis, post expenses and post tax. Question directed to you, Vineet, again. Uh, within the performing credit space, could you... Could you tell us which are the sectors that are key focus for Vivriti? Thanks, Rupini. Uh, now, the sector we are actually quite sector agnostic. Uh, now, we focus. Uh, we have we have gating criteria. Now, gating criteria is to is is one. Uh, again, I'm coming back to the point I made earlier on what we should do and what we shouldn't. Do. What we do not do is that we don't touch startups, we don't touch real estate, and we don't touch distressed. Right. Now that leaves a very wide market open. Within that market, we focus on companies that that certainly have a rating floor of triple B minus and higher. We certainly focus on companies that have a certain level of maturity, which means that they should have been in existence for three to five years. Right. We focus on companies where we are not taking a business model risk. We can take an execution risk, but not a business model risk. Right. And finally, and where this narrow stop is that we want to focus on companies where debt can play a role in their growth, which means that the return on assets of the company right, has to exceed, or return on capital employed has to exceed the pricing of the debt that they raise. So a company operating at an ROCE of say 6% cannot borrow at 12% and grow. It is actually going to result in something else for this company. right? So as a result, the focus uh, we have a significant focus towards all direct to consumer sectors. We also like uh, we also like B two B sectors such as packaging, such as logistics, and so on, right? And we are very, we are uh, we are a bit selective on the core sectors because our funds are uh, relatively longer tenor. So on the longer tenor funds, we will not take cyclicals, right? But on the shorter tenor funds, where where if cyclicals are on an upswing, we can invest in cyclicals as well. Right. So what will we not do? Distressed RE and startups. What we will do is based on the gating criteria I outlined. The next one directed to you, Som. It's one of my uh, favorite questions as well. Um, are there any other funds targeting the performing credit space? If yes, what differentiates you from the rest of them? Thanks, Rupini. And uh, thanks to who asked the question. Uh, we indeed like this one because it... Uh, helps us lay out why, in spite of being a very attractive space in terms of risk-adjusted return, to asset managers find it difficult to build skill in performing credits. Like Vineet mentioned, you have uh, several players focusing on the left hand and right side of the curve, at traded debt and high yield debt, and much lesser on the performing space for two reasons. Firstly, when you're looking at companies which are below the radar of publicly traded debt, the amount of publicly available information to be able to source and assess assets is usually limited, right? That's number one. Number two, when you want to track the performance of these companies after having invested in them on an ongoing basis, it is much more difficult than tracking the performance of say AAA companies who are posting their results on a quarterly basis. So sourcing as well as portfolio tracking are more difficult in the performing credit space as compared to traded debt. Now, what's this becomes doubly difficult when you have to maintain granularity in the portfolio, which you have to, to cut down risk. Now, what do asset managers resort to as a result? One of two things. One, increase the size of the investment so that the effort is worth it and you can track an investment which is a 100 or a 200 crores and above, which is why most of the managers that you will see in the performing credit space are interested in ticket sizes of 100 crores and above. The second is invest in higher yield, very specific situation or distressed debt, which makes sure that the alpha that you aim to make more than compensates for the effort for sourcing as well as tracking. 
Now, these are two things we as a group aim to solve for with the deep use of our digital infrastructure, our access to data, our access to a very wide variety of assets, and uh, our ability to monitor the position of these companies on an ongoing basis. Right? As a group, that is where we are significantly advantaged. To give you a, a quick number, today as, as a group, we cover over 1,100 companies in the performing credit space, and we are just scratching the surface. There are over 22,000 investment grade rated companies in our country, and we are at 5% of it, right? Now, we are adding at the rate of anything between 50 to 60 companies in terms of coverage as a group, which gives us immense choice as a manager to source as well as to create portfolios. That in effect is why we are advantaged. And what we lay on top of this is our lending DNA, our ability to assess risk, our ability to uh, structure vehicles right and get our fund propositions covering market caps. Back to you, Ruben. Thank you very much, Shom. That was, I think, a very brilliant uh, uh, summation of how we use group synergies and technology to be able to differentiate ourselves from the rest of the funds who operate in this area. Um, question, next question directed to you, Vineet. Uh, this is from Divya Patil of uh, Bloomberg News. This is a market-related question. What is your assessment of the Indian credit market? Are you seeing any red flags or expect credit to worsen as Indian authorities gradually roll back stimulus measures? Are you bullish or bearish or in some sectors? If yes, which are they and why? Thanks. Thanks, Rupini. Uh, now, uh, the Indian credit space has been going through an overhaul in the last, uh, in the last several years. Um, and some of these fundamental changes in the way in the way disclosures, transparency, as well as governance standards have improved, right, have, have reshaped how we should be looking at credit markets overall, right? And some of these have been gradual, right? Very gradual. For example, the emergence of credit bureaus since 2011, the, you know, the emergence of the of Aadhaar, you know, even, uh, even before uh, with, the, with the previous government, right, back in 2009, right? And the emergence of uh, of vast storehouses of data like GST, like uh, provident fund information, legal cases being digitized, etc. Right. And today, given the given the quality of information at your fingertips, right, a credit manager today has far more tools at their disposal to be able to take a decision. Now, having said that, they need to be set up to take that decision. Right. Now, if you are if you are if you are not set up with the right quality and infrastructure and investment in tech, right you will fall behind right so by no means would, would i say that the entire market is going to is going to do well on credit right today already you know, we've seen in the last couple of days you know npa data being published for public sector banks versus private sector banks there is a sharp differential the the the, the, the psu npa is a multiplier of four times over private sector bank npa right so certainly certainly all is not good certainly uh, cer certainly there are issues uh, in uh, in many many portfolios right but in general the performance of credit has actually improved over the last over the last uh, few years right from the sme space to the mid corporate space uh, and also to some extent to the larger corporate space uh, on account of better disclosures on account of more transparency and on account of uh, more technology being available being available to take these uh, to take these decisions now what are we bullish on we are definitely bullish on uh, services. We are definitely bullish on financial services. We are bullish on healthcare. We are bullish on 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 direct to consumer sectors. Uh, we are cautious on on cyclicals, right? We are cautious on any on any space uh, where there is a significant import element, right? Uh, but uh, in in general, we are also cautious on any sector which has a significant dependence on the government. Uh, from either a purchase perspective, a sale perspective, or very heavily regulated, right? But barring these filters, uh, today we're optimistic. We think the performing credit space is going to open up much, much more as some of the factors that I outlined take deeper and deeper root uh, into India. Thank you uh, very much, Vineet. Um, the next question is directed towards Shomendra and uh, the journalist, journalist would specifically have requested Shomendra to answer this question for us. 
during your presentation shomendra you have mentioned that you 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 have mentioned and you have explained how these funds will solve the liquidity problem could you please elaborate a little bit on that thank you surely rupini thank you uh, and thanks for asking the question when we talk of liquidity risk we are not referring to investors ability to redeem money from the fund on call there are mutual funds for that and to be able to do that one has to invest in very liquid securities which are lower yielding the issue happens when in a fund we invest in illiquid securities but give investors the right to withdraw money on call there is one only one of two things that's possible to be able to do that either you have to sell your assets which you will have to at distressed values because they are illiquid or you will have to find a, a new buyer for the units of the fund both of which are difficult so as a result the logical thing to do is to run illiquid strategies using closed ended funds because in many cases uh, like what we saw last year the issue was not fully with the quality of the investments the issue could be that the investor wants her money back on call and that spills that risk spills over to the other investors in their in the fund who don't want their money back so as a result what we mean by our funds not running liquidity risk is two things first we do not give any investors the right to call their money back and hence we protect all investors uh, yield as well as capital in the fund the second is that we do not invest in any instruments that outlast the tenor of the fund so for example we will not invest in a four year bond because the tenor of the fund is 3 and a half year because if we did at the end of 3 and a half years we would run the risk of having to sell that bond in the market and redeem capital to investors so all investments will be within the fund tenor these are the two things which i meant by the fund not running liquidity risk back to you rupini thank you very much uh, shom uh, we need this question is uh, directed uh, again uh, this is uh, this is a specific request from another journalist uh, to vineet sukumar could you numbers on the number of existing funds of vivriti in the performing credit space total asset size and targeted aum growth in the next 2 years sure uh, today we have uh, four funds operational uh, two more are being launched today so that makes it six uh, six funds today uh, expect to have around 11 funds by the end of this year and possibly another Uh, seven or eight launches in the next financial year right so our own our own assessment is that we will have to have anywhere between 15 to 20 funds by the end of march 2023 right uh, today we have raised capital uh, cumulatively of uh, a little or over 1550 crores so far right? uh, we expect to take this number up to around 4000 by the end of march 22 right and twice of that number approximately 8 8 1/2000 crores by march 2023 the reason for our optimism right uh, one we are seeing a significant amount of interest from both large domestic institutional as well as global investors in the performing credit space number two we see our uh, our offering of a combination of technology in person intelligence and structuring as being a significantly differentiated offering and three the yields are attractive okay back to Thank you very much, Vineet. Uh, well summed up. Um, this is a question on the category two debt AIFs. Um, Vineet, you may want to take this up again. Uh, do category two AIFs deduct any TDS, or does pass through status mean that there is no TDS involved? This is again from Neil Borate. right so uh, so actually uh, tax deducted at source uh, implies pass through status right because the tax that is being deducted or withheld by the category the fund manager is on the pan card of the investor right so although we may have to withhold some tax which may be around 10% uh, which and, and the rate could depend on the investor category right 
but this would depend on this would be on the pan card of the investor which means it is part of their tax and not part of the fund's tax filing right in now if the interest if the if the income is in the nature of uh, of interest yes we do deduct uh, tax at the rate of 10% right if the if the income is in the nature of capital gains uh, we might not right again that depends on tax advice that we will take but irrespective it, the fund is a pass through all category to alternate investment funds are pass are pass through as per the finance bill 2016 and will continue to remain so uh, the uh, the taxation status is that even if we withheld withhold tax it is on the pan card of the uh, of the investor and therefore part of their filing not our filing so there is no loss to the investor i hope that clarifies Yes, Vineet. Thank you very much. That was very simply uh, uh, put forward or explained. This is a very generic question that keeps uh, cropping up time and again. Um, uh, the next question again directed to you, Vineet. Uh, but before I take that question, I'm going to request the journalists to just send us more. We'd be happy to answer any questions about the market or about the space itself in which we perform. Great. Uh, so I will take the last two questions. Uh, the next question is uh, directed to Shomendr. Um, in the current economic scenario what do you think is a more relevant proposition inflating beating risk returns or uh, superior risk protection thank you rupini and uh, we don't make a choice between these two our whole thesis is about not needing to make a choice between return and risk uh, there's a third dimension to what we do which is sustainability i'll keep that aside for a minute to answer this specific question uh, our reason for launch of products like these and our reason to fill a gap is that today the market is choosing between one or the other there is safety or there is return the whole idea of bringing debt back into the portfolio of investors is to say that one should not change asset allocation strategy which means that to get yields one should not shift away from debt to something else we have to find the debt that gives us the right kind of returns while staying debt while staying resolutely predictable resolutely low volatility right so uh, to to answer so some of what i walked through in my presentations was aimed to to address this point that yes we are after yields that are better than the traded public space but this does not in any manner go to suggest that we should be taking on risk where we stand to lose capital so we we would we would be strong believers of an and rather than an or rupini thank you shom very nicely put uh, vinith this is the last question for the day and i'm directing this one towards you uh, governance is a major issue in companies you are targeting then there are lack of regulatory requirements in the aif area and miss such bottlenecks how are you going to convince your investors great question and that brings us to the to the core of uh, our risk management at uh, at vipti uh, fundamentally fundamentally the, the the reason we exist and the reason and the reason anybody should invest money into us is our ability to iron out the governance risk and therefore bring the focus only and only on default and business risk right now the job of vipti asset management amongst any other fund manager you find in the market is the ability to exactly that right to assess whether money is flowing to related parties to assess going through a time series of data of multiple quarters on any unusual movement in in costs in expenses in revenue in promoter salaries in uh, in any leakages our ability to look at to to, to, look, to look at data sets across uh, across provident funds across across legal cases to very quickly get early warning signals on anything going wrong with the portfolio these are all methods to check over this right it's it's very important for us to use external data to pinpoint the audited financial statements of a company through bank statements through tax records it's important for us to verify and cross verify that that money has not been leaked from a company right it's important for us to understand what is the level of engagement that independent directors genuinely have are they only there in name or are they really engaging with the company right and therefore we have built a series of algorithms as well as diligence diligence to be able to to be able to be able to pull this up right so governance is a very very important part of our diligence framework 50% of our assessment is using tech 
which the, today the market simply does not have. And the balance 50% is our hard work of being actually there in their premises and understanding how they do their business and how the founder is looking at the company. Fundamentally, we want to work with companies that want to scale and grow an IPO. Right? Although we're working in the private debt space, we want to work with companies that want to become public, right? which is why they will, be the, they will be ambitious enough to do the right things by their company, which is hire the right people, provide ESOPs, build transparency, make their earnings from the shares of the company rather than the money lying in the company. Right? And, that, and, that cho- and our ability to make their choice will differentiate us. Right? Uh, your second comment around AIF regulations, I think, are... Uh, you know, are or will be misplaced because I think the regulations today are actually quite robust uh, and are getting better over time. Having said that, uh, I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation that we are building disclosure standards that are at least equal to what any mutual fund in the country provides, if not better. We provide daily NAVs, we provide monthly fact sheets, we provide very detailed quarterly risk reports, and we also provide the ability for any client of ours to directly look at our diligence reports and see what we have assessed in a company. We have built independent directors on the board. We have built independent uh, investment committee members on the investment committee with vetoes. So we have gone the entire hall to ensure that our governance standards are very, very good. Rupini, back to you. Thank you very much, Vineet. I think that was a brilliant summation of how uh, diligence, governance, and monitoring are a core ethos and, and fundamentally us as Vivriti Asset Management. Uh, thank you once again and uh, stay safe. <laughs>